You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it the wrong way. This is Play by Play Cast, the world's number one sports media podcast. Wait, what? Nobody's fact checking it. Just keep going. Here we go. Who the hell is Happy Gilmore? Got all that on camera, right, John? Sure, I did. All right, because the red light was not on. The podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. Oh, you can stick me in some kind of Italian boat because that one is Gondola. Now, from New York. Really? All the big ones are from New York. Your host, Joe Godet. It's still Joel. Yeah, he will not be able to see very well, Cotton. All right, welcome back in another episode of Play by Playcast. Thanks, as always, for the subscribe, the stream, the download. My name is Joel Godet. This is the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. It's a professional development podcast that dives into the tips, chick. Tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparations of some of the biggest and best play-by-play announcers in the business. It is on social media at PXPCast. I am at Joel Godet, or you can shoot me an email, J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U dot E-D-U. I know if you're a minor league baseball broadcaster, you're listening to this right now and thinking, we're coming down the home stretch. You know, it's, it's August. It's the final month of the minor league baseball season final two months of the Major League Baseball season, but if you are a collegiate broadcaster, it's go time, baby. I'm doing this podcast today from Costa Rica. Tough assignment, but someone's got to do it. Uh, I'm with the Ball State men's basketball team as we're on one of our foreign tours that you're allowed to take as a Division One program uh, once every four years. So the team is in Costa Rica playing three games and doing some sightseeing, and I'm down here uh, doing some video chronicling. But when I get back, we land on Monday, Tuesday, soccer pictures for the newcomers. I think soccer practice is Tuesday, if not Tuesday, Wednesday they open. And uh, they've got a scrimmage a week and a half after that. And football camp has already begun. So I'm missing the beginning of football camp to be uh, here in Central America. So when I arrive back, my first day, I'll wake up, go to shoot some soccer gifts and pictures and lineup graphic video type things and then go to football practice because we are in full swing. August 31st kickoff for Ball State and Indiana and it is August 1st as I record this, August 2nd as you listen to this episode of Play by Play Cast. So strap in. Our guest today is a guy who's going through very much a similar situation. He's getting ready for another season as the voice of the BYU Cougars. Greg Rubel is our guest today, and we'll talk a little bit about his process at the beginning of a season, how he gets himself uh, focused, set, and ready for football and what he does during camp. But we'll also really dive into some minutia with Greg, a guy that if you read about him and, and you know a little bit about him, is really in the weeds. I mean, he's like perfect for this podcast in terms of listening back to everything that he does and uh, his preparation is methodical and his approach to this is uh, incredible and, and craftsy, not in like a knitting or crochet way, but in, you know, approaching this as more than a profession and um, a trade, but as a true craft and an art form. So uh, Greg is, is perfect for what we do here. And I'm kind of, Embarrassed we haven't had him on here sooner. Uh, but he's been the, the college football voice for BYU since uh, around the early 2000s. And before that, he started on their basketball side. Uh, also does some soccer with BYU, uh, some soccer with Utah Royals FC as well. He went to BYU, actually is from Canada, and he'll talk about it. It was, was not a huge like BYU sports fan until he got to college and like went to the games and all of a sudden it kind of clicked for him. Um, But he went to BYU and then went on a mission trip and came back and in some senses professionally has never really left. He has been in and around Provo dating back to when he was in college and um, has really carved out a nice niche for himself as uh, one of the uh, preeminent voices of collegiate sports um, on the West Coast and throughout the country. So Greg Rubel is our guest today. And where we start is with uh, what exactly he does. Because BYU has its own television station. You probably get it. You've probably come across it. Uh, BYU TV. It's on most cable providers. So 
Greg is the director of broadcast media at BYU, is not only their voice, but also has an interesting role because there are a bunch of different pots to put your hands in. So we start there with Greg Rubel this week on PXP Cast. Well, officially, my job title is director of broadcast media for BYU Athletics. But practically, um, it's, it's the voice of the Cougars is, is the common uh, vernacular for, for, for what I do. Um, there are some administrative responsibilities and some oversight functions uh, and some show hosting functions as well. But uh, primarily, it's, it's play-by-play uh, for BYU's two main sports, football and men's basketball. Plus, I also do uh, the women's soccer broadcasts and uh, dabble in baseball as of this past season. I was going to say, it's got to be the only uh, football, basketball, soccer job in the country or like a very select yeah. club. Yeah, I, I don't run into too many guys who have that, but I kind of <laughs> like it. Uh, soccer has been kind of a personal favorite. And so when the opportunity came along and they asked if I'd have any interest, I said, let's uh, let's let, let's squeeze it in. Let's let's try and make it work. And so. Uh, there's no doubt that as the season gets longer, uh, some football and basketball conflicts do arise. Uh, so, so I can't do you know the entire 20, 21, 22 games, uh, but I do most and as many as I can squeeze in. You're also you're in a unique spot from the standpoint that you've also got BYU TV surrounding the university and the university sports. Um, like, what role does that play in what you do, or what role do you play in what it does? Yeah, my office is located in the BYU Broadcasting Building, which houses BYU TV and BYU Radio. Uh, and, and those two platforms uh, give BYU a pretty unprecedented exposure for a collegiate program. Uh, BYU TV is on most satellite systems uh, nationally, and BYU Radio is on Sirius XM 143 uh, coast to coast. In addition to the apps, of course, you're going to get uh, for TV and radio coverage uh, through BYU TV and BYU Radio. But, uh, you know, the, the, the facilities alone, uh, put BYU in a pretty unique uh, position, and it's uh, it, it's kind of anecdotal now that uh, when when BYU has visitors from uh, national outlets or ESPN comes to you know to to, to call, um, they remark at just how um, you know top notch and high level uh, the facilities are here for broadcasting, and and BYU athletics has certainly been uh, the beneficiary. Does it give you a little bit more? Um... I don't know, freedom or leeway or creativity in terms of what you're able to do uh, job-wise also and uh, outside of just doing traditional play-by-play, how you can cover BYU and what it allows you to do in in your spot. Yeah, the the weekly shows we produce, and it's more than just coaches' shows, but the coaches' shows themselves are are produced at a a really high production value. There's so many things you can do because of, uh, of, I don't want to call them toys, but uh, the (laughs) high-tech, Uh, uh, you know, devices at your disposal here in this building. Um, Pretty much anything you'd want to do on national scope from a national production, you do in this building. Um, It it is that developed and that high tech. And so uh, from a creativity standpoint, yeah, we we, we, we try to hold ourselves to a very high standard in terms of the kind of things that uh, that fans and viewers and listeners would like out of their out of their productions. And and there are a lot of them going on. Um, There are expanded pregame and postgame a broadcast from both BYU TV and BYU Radio. We have in-week shows in addition to just the coaches' shows. We have uh, kind of an X and X's and O's weekly show uh, hosted by some former Cougar football players uh, called After Further Review, kind of a play a play breakdown, if you will, truly X's and O's. Uh, we have a show featuring uh, all three football coordinators on BYU TV nationally each week as well called The Coordinator's Corner. So beyond just the straight coaches' show and, and play-by-play, I think there's a lot around the broadcast that uh, truly augment the production for uh, for Cougar Nation. What kind of toys are we talking about? Well, anything graphically you'd hope to do uh, <laughs> at, at, at any national shop, you can pretty much find here. Uh, the graphics package uh, is always second to none, has just been updated again for this upcoming season. The look is super sharp and super professional, and, uh, and, and the number of students, in addition to true you know, full-time employees, uh, the number of students that are gaining experience in these productions uh, send them off uh, in a really uh, prepared fashion to enter the the job market and and, and get jobs that that uh, you know they hope to have eventually. I have to imagine too, within all of that, like you've got to be the most prepared play by play guy in the country at the end of the week in in some essence because like I would I would love a a, a studio show where like Ball State guys are breaking down specific plays from the previous week's game. Um, just kind of laid out for me each week. I mean, it, like what you've got at your fingertips is is got to be uh, a miraculous to be a part of. 
And then from a from a play by play standpoint, um, I'm really uh, blessed because of the the cooperation we have. I, I'm technically an athletics department employee, so um, I, I'm a department employee. So as 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 a result, I've got really good coordination and cooperation with uh, the coaching staffs from the various programs I cover. And so, you know, when, when I want to watch video each week of the previous week's games, the upcoming opponents, practices, I, it, it's all at my at my fingertips. Um, I, I literally have an iPad app uh, from which I can view everything I need to see to get me ready to call a game. And that is from games to practices to scouting reports. And so it, it really does make my job, I'm not going to say easy, but it, 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 makes it, uh, it, it makes it hopefully better done by the amount of preparation I can, I can put into it. And a small degree of trust there, too, if they're going to give you the iPad with the access to the, the video portal which is always good. Well, absolutely. And, 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 and a lot of what I do is for public dissemination. And a lot of what I do is for private uh, utility that then shows up on game day. Um, but yeah, and there's an understanding and it's, it, it's, it's sort of unspoken that they trust me, um, you know, to, to, to only distribute what is for public consumption and to keep as personal background and personal assistance, the things that might help me on game day, but might not be something that you want out during the week, for example, but uh, the tools are there for me to utilize and there is trust, and um, you know, cross fingers, nothing's really happened to to uh, to change that protocol, which is a really, uh, again, something I really depend on and do not take for granted in getting ready for for broadcasts each week. If I can roll all the way back uh, to the beginning, because this is how many years at BYU total now for you? Well, my my first year on the football radio broadcast crew was in 1992. Okay. So, so I think it's going to be my 28th season yeah, say, so on the broadcast years. crew. Yeah, so so 92 was my first year on the radio crew, and that was as the sideline locker room reporter. So um, I had nine seasons of sideline uh, before I got the play-by-play gig, and I've been this will be my 19th season of play-by-play, so 28 total. And about four or five seasons, actually not even that many, yeah, about four or five seasons into, into my, my sideline gig, uh, the, the basketball play-by-play uh, gig um, opened up, and so I got that in 19, well, 96, 97 is, is, is the first season I started doing basketball. And I kind of split that season with my predecessor, Paul James, who, who, did, who has since passed just last year. Um, but he had some heart trouble that year. And in fact, that, that's actually what put me in the booth was he had emergency heart procedure, and, and, and they needed somebody to fill in on pretty short notice. And so that's kind of how I got my start um, in play-by-play. But that when he came back from his surgery, he did only the home games to end that season. I did the road games. And then while he was gone, I did all the games. And so in that 96-97 season, I probably did 15 or 16 of the 26. And then the following year, uh, 97-98, uh, I began basketball play-by-play on a full-time basis. And so um, this will be, oh, gosh, um, I guess 23 years, maybe 23 years of basketball play-by-play. 23, 24 uh, coming up this fall. Well, and I guess your and whole... then soccer is uh, so soccer is a little more recent. This will be my sixth season with the women's soccer program. Uh, your whole career, though, in some sense, is really like you kind of went to BYU and then, professionally speaking, never really left. Correct? In some yeah, way, shape, like you've always been around uh, it. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in Canada. And so, I, you know, I wasn't a lifelong BYU fan. In fact, I wasn't really familiar with uh, much about uh, American collegiate sports. Um, I, I was a Canadian kid. I, I, I did come down to go to school at BYU. Uh, in fact, my, my freshman year was their national championship football year, 1984. Um, and I was a student season ticket holder. You know, I, I was just the guy in the stands at that point. Um, and, and, and I really... Uh, became accustomed with BYU sports by living it as a fan, and and so uh, it was after my or in my junior year at BYU uh, when I got an internship with the BYU rights holder KSL in Salt Lake City. That internship turned into full-time employment while I was still a student at BYU. So my last semester as a BYU student, I was actually working full-time already at at uh, KSL Radio in Salt Lake, which was the BYU rights holder. But I was working an overnight weeknight shift uh, while a full-time student at BYU. So that last semester, I was literally working 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., taking a bus in Salt Lake down to Provo, trying to stay awake through classes in the morning into the early afternoon at BYU, busing back to Salt Lake, getting some sleep, getting up, going to work, and doing it over again 
uh, five days a week as a full-time employee. So, um, you know, from a positive standpoint, I didn't have the shock of entering the job market. I was already in it. I was already employed. <laughs> but it was a grind. It was a grind trying to get my, get, get that diploma. Uh, that last semester was, uh, was trying just to make sure that I was uh, able to get passing grades and stay awake long enough to get all that done. And you and I, uh, you and I actually share in that my when I was in high school, I started working for the county newspaper, and my first beat was the high school fencing reporter. Um, so I, I think we we share a first uh, a first uh, sport of coverage in there, don't we? Yeah, it's funny you'd say that. Yeah, <laughs> it, because um, when, when I, I I literally had just turned seventeen. Um, the first week of my freshman year at BYU in 1984, and, and I knew that I wanted to be a broadcaster, and I knew that BYU had a really, um, a really strong broadcast program, and I, I just wandered down uh, to the news department newsroom, introduced myself to the news director, said I'd be getting into the communications classes and, and, and getting into the major as soon as I could, but I wanted to get put to work in whatever uh, he could have me do, and I said, you know, sports is kind of where I want to end up, and he said, well, um, how about you go out and find 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 a a club sport on campus that no one's covering, and see what you can do with that? And I ended up uh, visiting the fencing club and and did a story on fencing uh, at BYU, and that ended up being my first ever broadcast story that was on the air a couple of weeks into my freshman year. So that's how I got my start. What was it about? Uh, it was it was literally just about the existence <laughs> of the fact. Uh, of, the, of the fencing club. <laughs> this is a thing um, that we have. It, it may not get much much publicity here on campus, but uh, there, there, there's this dedicated group of athletes um, that have this little corner of campus <laughs> where they do their thing, and I got to to know them a little bit and describe the sport, and then uh, put it on put it on TV. I feel like though, like since the beginning, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but like it's, since the beginning, you've you've really done a a, a good job of treating it as a craft so to speak um and and i'm just like inferring based on like i i know growing up you you did like choir and you did public speaking and uh, like very voice honing type things that like set the stage for what we all do professionally um was your approach really i don't know if targeted is the right word but like how did you set out approaching this industry and this craft early on um, where I feel like a lot of us are just like sports, microphone, go to work, and then it gets refined as we get older. Yeah, my, my, my father was the public address announcer for uh, the Saskatoon Blades uh, Western uh, Hockey League team in the, in the Western Junior Hockey League in Canada. And so Saskatoon was my original hometown. And so my, my dad, he wasn't in the business per se. He was, a, he was an, an energy industry professional. He worked in oil and minerals, and that was his real life job but he had a really great voice and and somebody who was associated with the hockey team heard him speak and said man have you ever thought about public address you've got a great voice for this and and so that started a relationship that my dad had with the saskatoon blades and so my dad would take me often with him into uh, the press box into his announcer's booth at the old saskatoon arena a glorious old barn by the way that's since been demolished but what a great hockey building and um so as as you know some of my earliest memories as a young boy were being in that booth next to the organist's booth because every every good hockey arena had an organ back in the days. And so um, it was the organist's booth, my dad's announcer booth, and that microphone. And I got to watch him uh, do his thing and and realize for the first time, Joel, at a pretty early age about the power of, a, of an open mic. Um, my dad's voice would boom around the building and, and announce goals and assists and penalties and so and so, your lights are on, and uh, uh, I, I just got used to the notion of speaking into a mic at a really early age. And I, I'm not blessed with my dad's great voice; he truly had a magnificent voice. Um, but I, I, again, I got used to that notion of what would happen when you hit the on switch, and that was appealing to me. And um, so, you know, as I, you know, developed some interests scholastically and academically, um, I realized that if I wanted to do anything in the public arena. Um, using my voice or being a broadcaster would uh, require me to get exposure to situations that would put me in the in 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 front of audiences, and so that's where you know, public speaking contests and choir performances and performing in plays and all those kinds of things got me, you know, over any sense of stage fright and got me used to speaking uh, publicly. Um, I still have a lot of work to do. Um, my natural tendency is to speak really briskly and quickly, and over time I had to learn to develop a slower style. Uh, to be properly understood, 
and all those things came in time. But once I realized I wanted to be a broadcaster, I really dove into that and, and would contact broadcasters and ask for tours of radio stations and TV stations and, and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, be pesky with, with people and ask a lot of questions who were in the industry and look for exposure in any way I could. Uh, and once I got to college, that really, you know, was the springboard because BYU had such a hands-on program. You could do so many things in TV and radio and writing and producing. It got me exposed to all the different facets of the craft. And, and I, yeah, I do view it as a craft. It's, it's not the hardest job in the world, but you also can't, I don't think, just, just settle, you know, settle into your seat on, on, on game day and expect to do a great job without uh, the hours of prep beforehand. And so um, I, I guess I do treat it like a craft and hope to continue to get better and better at it because I haven't called a perfect game yet, and it may not happen, but that's always the endeavor. How did you learn to speak slower? Uh, force. Um, I, 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 was, I was told that um, I was going to be removed from the campus FM radio station until I slowed down. Um, and do and that yeah. kind of got, <laughs> yeah. And so taking, taking me off the air did it. Um, and it's still then. It, it was still a, um, a really focused effort. And again, just even today, my tendency is to, um, you know, be kind of energetic in my delivery. And, and yet, uh, for me, this is still a lot slower than I ever used to be. And, and, and the ability to be um, understood and understood properly while still describing as many things as you care to in a short span of time relative to play-by-play -play, uh, remains a challenge that I still really embrace. What else have you done vocally in terms of, like, or how did choir or public speaking classes um, refine your voice and refine your approach? Well, I, I think more than anything, it was it was just the 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 um, the, the, the practice makes perfect, uh, you know, school of thought. Um, and the, the more time you the more times you do things, uh, the more comfortable you're going to be, and and the more prepared you're you're going to be when it uh, when, when when the platform shifts or, or or when the setting is now different. Um, and, and again, I I think stage fright's not a huge thing. It never really was a huge thing for me, but people who ask, you know, when I get, do I get nervous before broadcast? I haven't been nervous for, for a really long time. I can get excited. I can be anxious about how the team's going to perform, but I don't really get nervous anymore. Um, and it's, it's basically down to, uh, you know, the, the practice component, having done it as many times as I've done it in different settings. I don't feel like I have need uh, to be, uh, nervous or uncertain as long as I've done the prep beforehand. Again, that's the biggest thing. Um, I'm able to put the headset on and be comfortable when the ball's about to be kicked, be, be kicked off, not because I think I'm, I'm having a great voice day, but because I think uh, I've had a good week of prep. And, and when it comes to my voice itself, um, you know, one of the things choir and public speaking did teach me were different, you know, tools to, you know, control um, the sound of your voice and, and how it's delivered. But I still find, Joel, that, you know, when, when, when a crazy, you know, unbelievable, phenomenal play happens on the last, you know, snap of the game, sometimes your voice is going to do things you don't want it to do. And sometimes you're going to sound the way you don't want to sound. Uh, sometimes emotion takes over and takes you in places and puts your, voices, it puts your voice in octaves that you don't think it's going to go. So that's part of it, too. Um, <laughs> at some point, you do lose a bit of that element of control. And that's one of the great things about sport. But one of the things, too, that I just wonder, oh, you know, why couldn't I just have kept it together a little bit? But, you know, sometimes emotion takes over. Did you like your call of the uh, the Tanner Mangum Hail Mary against Nebraska? I guess if uh, we're, we're on the topic of big plays. For, yeah, I mean, if I like it, it's only because um, fans liked it. You know, if, if, if fans like it, then I'll, then I'll go along with them. But nobody ever anticipates that sort of loss of vocal control, if you will. Um, and, you know, it, it, it happened that way. It just, it, it was, you know, I, I'd never actually called a Hail Mary uh, game-winning touchdown before that play. Um, and it was just such a, a, you know, miraculous is too strong a word, but such a, an unprecedented event in such a big setting uh, against a big-name program that never loses at home to, to non-conference teams kind of thing that it just kind of in that moment, things got kind of carried away. And yeah, immediately you're like, oh man, you know, I, 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 that sounds pretty crazy. My voice sounds pretty wild, but um, ultimately the fans were kind of, were kind of right, right along with you saying we were doing the same thing. You know, we all went nuts. And so uh, there it is. It was crazy play. It was a wild play. 
uh, I was super excited. It was a great day for BYU, and so I look at all those things and just kind of have to roll with it. I mean, and ultimately, like if the fans like it and they latch on to it, you know, like how many how many masters can you please, so to speak? Is that if if they buy in, in some respects, we do our job. Yeah, and, you know, and, and it's one of you know how many hundreds of plays I would have called that year. Um, and not every play sounds that way, right? Not every, you know, um, you know, a gain of six on on third and nine is not going to sound like the hail mary uh, at Nebraska. Um, and so you have you know you, you have your moments, and they are just moments. But when they happen, uh, they're pretty memorable. But for the most part, you know, you you do your job as professionally as you can, and and you hope that uh, again, ultimately, the listener satisfaction is uh, is hopefully what's going to matter most and that, that's kind of the, what, I, what i've tried to um tried to kind of uh convince myself of let me ask you about description um a little bit from the standpoint of we talk about speaking too quickly or, or slowing yourself down while still trying to get in what you feel is an adequate description of what's happening in front of you um you know we had this discussion a couple of weeks ago with kevin harlan because he has like this very rapid fire uh you know list of things that he sees before a play happens but it works uh-huh. uh and yeah. and he kind of talked about it as as finding your rhythm and finding your your melody of what's happening in front of you uh exactly. how, does, yeah, how does it work for you that way and, and how do you prioritize yeah. what has to go into your rhythm and your melody to paint the right picture well first of all um uh, there are a few things i want to i want to hop off on that um my my predecessor Paul James. I already talked about how you know instrumental he was in in, in my career. I got I got my my opening thanks to him. I've been on his crew for a number of years, and then when he needed to 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 take a few weeks off, I was there to kind of do his job till he got back. And he had a great voice, and I often describe it as kind of melodic and and musical and rhythmic because I really thought his delivery was just like that. And there are many broadcasters who have that same kind of quality, and I wish I had that kind of um, lyrical or, or musical kind of quality to it. I do the best I can, but I don't think I could ever be Paul James that way. But I know, but I know what I know. I know what Kevin's referring to, and I know what I'd be shooting for. Um, and when it comes to Kevin himself, I've never met Kevin. I, I, I've been in the same venue as him, but I've never, I don't think, actually formally met him. Not that he'd remember. Um, but he is uh, one of my ideals when it comes to the art of description. Um, I think he does it better than anybody. Um, you know, a lot of people know him just as a TV play-by-play guy, but, but those who know him as a radio guy know just how, how great um, a descriptor he is. Um, and, and every time I listen to Kevin, I pick up on something else that I'll try and work into my own broadcast. And there's never a broadcast that I get with Kevin that I don't, that I don't find something new to latch on to. Um, I, I don't know that I could give you too many examples, but I know that, um, you know, it would stick out to me uh, when he talks about the quarterback's um, you know, towel tucked into his waist, flapping in the breeze, coming from behind, that kind of thing. Those are the kind of things, kinds of things Kevin Harlan will in, include. He'll, he'll include when, when a quarterback licks his fingers before the snap. Kevin will tell you that that, that, that just happened. So he's a master at it, and, and I do steal a lot of what he tries to do in, in my calls. And I'm always kind of parenthetically, Joel, I do a lot of listening to play-by-play, just for that reason, I want to see what else is out there. What else good is being done that I can incorporate and adapt in, in, into how I do my job. Now, when it comes to the, my, my checklist, I have one too. Um, you know, in, in football, it's a real challenge working with your play by your, with your, with your color uh, commentary partner in terms of style of play. Are you playing? Uh, d- d- does the team you're calling uh, go no huddle? Does the opponent go no huddle? How much time are you going to have between plays is, first of all, a big part of what kind of day you're going to have. Does the team play option or not? That's also another big, uh, another big component of how much you're going to be able to see and or find in a play. But I do try and get into my rhythm. Once my color guy has, has finished kind of recapping the previous play, I want to get into uh, formation. I want to get into balance. I want to get into back location. And then I want to give a quick look defensively at what the quarterback is seeing before the play begins. Those are some things that I want to kind of deliver in addition to, of course, you're looking at score and time at a pretty regular uh, basis as well. You never want to leave that behind. That's the most important thing after all will be your score and time. But those are some things that I really look for uh, on a play-by-play basis to get in before the next snap. What's too much 
what's not enough? Like, what's the right balance? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't think you can say the timers score enough. I don't think you can. I mean, I think I think there is a way to. You know, you're, you're not you're not saying it every ten seconds, obviously, but you're not leaving it. You know, every five minutes either. You're 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 doing it probably every two minutes at the most, and that may be a bit heavy in terms of making sure people know what 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 score is and and, and what time is left. Um, but I think it's almost a sense of personal fatigue. If I feel like I'm that I've said too much or I've gone too long, it's it. it then the listener's probably sensing the same thing. Um, I, I love working with a partner. Uh, there are a lot of play-by-play guys who work solo. I respect the heck out of them. Uh, I love having a partner. Um, I just love giving the listener a break from me and a fresh perspective, and and a different voice, and a different sound, and a different timbre, and a different tone. All those kinds of things come into play. Uh, and again, I think the guys who do it solo are amazing. Um, I need to give myself a little bit of a break as much as I think the listener needs a different perspective um, during the course of the broadcast. And so it's almost a personal sense thing, uh, you know, when I've maybe said too much, but I don't think, uh, I almost think you can't give too much description. It's it, the more you can give the listener, the better. I really do just take that whole notion of, of, of eyes and ears really literally. And, and I want to give the listener just as much of a transportation as I can into what I'm seeing. Generally speaking, where did your where did your education and all of that come from, and and how did you come to perfect that? Particularly because your first was your first play by play game the the that basketball game you filled in on for BYU. Yeah, it was a it was a fifty one point loss. Um, oh. I, I I think it was I I, I want to say ninety five to forty four. Oh. Um, I, I, it was, um, I, I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably going to dig it up <laughs> because I'm genuinely curious. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it was 95, 44, and I'm literally just going to leaf through and find, uh, the score. Cause I, that, 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 that's what rings a bell to me. So it was 96, 97. It was at Washington, November 26th, 95, 44. Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Paul, so the, the, the situation was, um, so three days prior was Saturday, the 23rd of November, back in 96, and BYU was playing Utah in Salt Lake City football. And, um, and it was during the pregame show that Paul had his heart episode. And he did the game while hooked up to monitors, and the paramedics were working on him while he was doing his job. And he signed a waiver saying that he would finish off the game while refusing medical attention. And they said, you've got to get to a hospital as soon as you're done, Right. And so the game ends, BYU wins it, and he goes to the hospital, and they say, You're, Mr. James, you, you need six bypasses as soon as possible. So he was scheduled for sextuple bypass surgery, uh, and there was a basketball game coming up in Seattle two days after that, and he said, you've got to get on a plane and go do that game. And so that was it. That's how it happened. And so my first game literally was a 51-point loss in a season, Joel, in which BYU went 1-25. and So... The BYU basketball team that year went one and twenty-five. I got to call the one win. Paul didn't get any of the wins that year, as it turned out. I got the one, and uh, and that was Paul's last year calling basketball. So the following season, I began full time. But that's how it came for me. It was going to Seattle um, three days after that football game, knowing I was about to call my first ever game uh, in place of the great Paul James, and I had never called a game of any kind. Um, you know, I, I just hadn't had the opportunity, uh, not high school, not small college, nothing. I, I, this was it. And so I went on the air on that Tuesday night in Seattle, uh, having not done it before and really not sure if I could do it. Um, and all I had was really the confidence of Paul James and, and hopefully my employer that I could pull it off. And uh, again, not the toughest job in the world, but if you've never done it before, it's pretty daunting. And just getting through that night was, uh, was half the battle and uh, very memorable and again, not memorable for BYU because we got drilled in a really tough year, but um, that was how it started. And I don't know that I have perfected it yet, but I know that what, what did instruct me and your initial question was, where did I get that education? And it really was those years of having Paul James in my headset. Um, I, I was hosting in the studio when he would call basketball games. I was a sideline guy for the football games. And so I had him in my ears for nine years. Uh, and, and those years really instructed me as to how to do this thing. Um, but I have, I remember the distinct impression when I would walk the sidelines of the football games and Paul's calling the game and from field level, I'm just barely catching up with, with, with what Paul's already called. 
And, and I just couldn't fathom how he could memorize all those names and numbers and make these descriptions while the ball was in the air and, and knowing who's going to catch it. And I was having to catch up mentally with him. He was just so quick at everything. And that's been the biggest challenge is to make sure that I can be as quick as Paul James was in making those descriptions. And um, it always keeps me on my toes. What was the biggest education of that first year once you, you first got into it and, and are learning on the fly and the difference in having him in your ear for all of that time? And then uh, I guess when you finally realize that, that Paul's not there and, and it's you that, that's in the driver's seat. Well, uh, learning to work with a partner was uh, one of the one of the um, first things to accomplish. Um, I, I used um, two or three partners that year. Uh, Paul's original partner stayed with me for a few games, and then he uh, bowed out, and I had to find my own color guy, um, which I did to get through the season. Uh, working with a partner was the first thing, establishing some kind of chemistry, some kind of rhythm, uh, just being conversant. Um, using the right terminology, making the right descriptors at the right time, um, and, and, and just basically getting game to game a sense that I'm getting better at this or that I'm not making the same mistakes over and over again. That was the biggest thing for me to accomplish, I think, was just getting game to game uh, more proficient at what I was trying to do. In a way, it was maybe a help that BYU had such a rough year Maybe there was less pressure on all of us at a certain point. You know, they they were not going to go anywhere. They were one in twenty five. The interim coach was not going to be retained. He was having a tough go, but he he was of such good humor, and and was such the right guy for me to work with as a head coach. That is that it made that first year with only one win as bearable and enjoyable as possible. Um, and I credit a lot to Tony Ingle, the interim head coach that year, who would later go on to win I think a D three and an NAIA national championship with other schools. Um, I credit Tony for making that first year bearable and actually, like I said, kind of enjoyable, even though we were losing every time out and getting drilled in the process. Uh, we've talked a lot about preparation, uh, and you've brought up how critical that's been over the course of your career. Um, is it true you have databases of statistics that you update regularly? Yeah, cer certain elements, uh, or rather certain um, tools have, have come to us in recent years that are, that are available to everybody. Certain websites are helpful, and certain subscriptions are helpful. But a lot of the databases are things that I like to keep um, uh, independently. Um, and some, you know, most are spreadsheet format, uh, and, and these are just things that, have, um, that I've developed over time that, that help me in establishing a few important win-loss correlations, what I think really matters in terms of what wins and loses games. My most extensive databases are in football. I don't need as much in basketball uh, because a lot of the other folks out there do it so well, Ken Pomeroy primarily. Um, and there are also uh, analytics programs with which the programs I work with are associated that I can have access to that also help me see what the coaches are seeing from an analytical perspective. But from a football standpoint, there are a lot of independent um, databases I like to maintain on my own. I get interns involved in helping to uh, manage them as well so they have responsibilities themselves in the fall. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I think it all helps me uh, create um, the picture that I need going into each week's uh, game uh, what – factors are actually going to be the most important where BYU is trending. And, you know, in the past, you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago, when I would, you know, stumble upon, you know, what I think was a, a, an interesting or important statistical nugget, I would, I, I would have to retain it until game day when I could maybe, you know, um, introduce it in a way that made sense. But now, as soon as I find something interesting, I can, I can tweet it out. And, and my, my listeners or my followers can, can see what I'm seeing and then pick up on the trends I'm picking up on and seeing what I think is important at, at a time I think is important. Um, and and my, my, my Twitter feed has been a big way for me to communicate with my audience the things I think are going to help um, aid their enjoyment on game day. And so, you know, tweets are a big part of what I do as well. I mean, it, it, it almost kind of sounds kind of silly to say it's part of your job, but I think a big part of my job is using my Twitter account and, and getting information out to fans. And uh, I, I've had a lot of fun with that. And some may think I, I maybe tweet too much, but I, I think I tweet uh, the things that are interesting and important. You used to trade facts with Bronco Mendenhall too. Was that, was that true when he was there? Yeah. You know, you know it, there, there are coaches and Bronco is one of them um, who would, uh, would like, would welcome a statistical packet uh, on a weekly basis of, of what was, you know, what, what I was finding, what I was picking up on. 
it wasn't the only tool he utilized, but it was one of the tools that he kind of utilized to help form um, his program pillars. Uh, he had a lot of other, you know, resources in doing that, but I would kind of, um, you know, let him know what I was seeing and, 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 and share with him the stats I was picking up on and see how they had all, how they all uh, kind of combined with what he was already working on. And, and, and Kalani Sataki and his staff are the same way. Um, if, if there's things that I've done research on that I think might, that they might find interesting, they welcome it. They don't say we've got it covered. No, thanks. They say, this is great. Appreciate it. Bring it on. So I love when, when coaches embrace the same things I'm embracing. And I find that a lot. How do you, I feel like this is a, a conversation you get into a lot with baseball people in particular nowadays, but like, how do you work in what you might find statistically and, and make it understandable and make it fit within the context and the narrative of a game that you're calling um, while not being overbearing as well and, and, and making it uh, digestible, particularly if we're talking in a football and basketball sense, um, when like versus baseball, we, we've got so much less time to get something in like that that can help us um, paint the picture of what we're trying to say about where a team is. Well, I like to bring into uh, the booth with me every week um, a, a cardstock page with a column for each team with a number of elliptical notes. Um, ellipses indicate that, 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 that they're short enough to be digestible, okay? And, and so these little digestible nuggets can go in um, as, as soon as a touchdown is scored that gives BYU a 7 nothing lead in the first quarter, boom, out pops my BYU record when scoring first under Kalani Satake. Hmm. Or, um, you know, out pops my BYU's record after one quarter when leading, if they hit the break, leading 7-3. to three. Uh, I, I've got them all queued up, and they're just waiting for the trigger. And not everything gets used. In fact, I would say, you know, of the notes I bring into a football game, gosh, maybe – 25% on a given day, maybe 50 on another, but I, I never, never, ever does everything get used. I, I have way more than I, than I ever end up sharing during the course of a broadcast, but I do have certain triggers I'm looking for and waiting for. And the key is to make sure that I'm sharp enough to have remembered the trigger when it happens. Um, but uh, I, I, I find that during the course of the week, I've kind of primed my listeners, if you will, to things to look for. And then the game day is almost kind of a refresher of sorts when those events occur. I was going to say, what is your, your prep like to make sure that, you've, that, that you're sharp enough to be able to reference all of those things and, and know exactly where to look and be ready for it in any, in any given moment? Well, I, I try not to get too mundane and too bogged down in, in, in numerical data because some things don't really matter, but a lot of things do. And I try and restrict it to the things that have tended to matter over time. I have a bit of an informal, kind of a personal threshold, Joel. Um, when it comes down to win-loss correlations, sometimes it's more correlation than it is causation, and other times you get a pretty strong causation. But either way, if I find that a certain win-loss trend hits at an 85% mark or above, I, then I really tend to zero in on it. Um, between 70 and 85, you could have something there. Uh, under 70, and it's almost kind of hit or miss. But when you get to those 85s and above, I really look to those. And, and there are a number of uh, win-loss correlations over, you know, since 1970. Like, for example, LaBelle Edwards came here in 1972 to BYU as head coach. And so I've got one set of database, one set of databases that are kind of 1972 to present. I've got another that are sort of like 2005, Broncos' first year to present. And I've got another that's, that's Kalani Satake's first year to present. And I kind of have three different frames of reference. But in all these frames of reference, I tend to look for those strong correlations at 85% or better. 85% is kind of a random number, but you'll find that if you take a 13-game schedule and, and multiply it by .85, you're going to have a double-digit win season. And I think that's what everyone aspires to have is at least a 10-win season. And if you're doing that, you're, you're operating at a pretty high level. And so 85% is kind of a high-level benchmark for me for win-loss correlations. And so I really tend to, tend to focus in on those categories. And when those categories pop up, those are ones I want to, I want to really keep an eye on in the course of a game and the course of a season. And, and my prep during the week um, does involve you know, a lot of research on those particular trends and updating those particular trends and then going deeper than that. And, 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 and I've, I've, I've focused a lot more recently in recent years on – on uh, defensive three and outs, for example, offensive three and outs, um, third and shorts 
uh, as part of the overall third down picture, uh, individual target and reception rates, including drop rates, which we're going to track a little more closely this year. I want to find what kind of really matters out there to a team and to a program. And hopefully those are the things that my listeners hear uh, on game day. Um, I asked you about Tanner Mangum earlier in terms of how, how you described that, that, that Hail Mary play against Nebraska. Um, yeah. But I want to ask you about a different player you've had a, a chance to describe as well, and that's uh, Jimmer Fredette. Uh, mm. um, I asked the question a while ago um, to, to Tim Roy from the Warriors about Steph Curry in terms of uh, how you describe what he does on a daily basis to make it still sound remarkable when he just continues to do insane things night in and night out. Um, when you had somebody like Jimmer Fredette, how was it challenging, maybe in a way that's different than any other basketball game normally, um, to consistently convey what you were seeing while making sure that it didn't just become the ordinary, that, that people could still understand how amazing it was? And, and Tim, by the way, is another guy that I've enjoyed listening to over the years and, and could take a lot from his calls. I really love the way that, that Tim calls a game, and I have borrowed some of his vernacular and incorporated it in my own calls over the years. Um, he's a good one. But Jimmer, it was almost this sense, uh, I found myself a lot of times kind of verbally shaking my head. You know, that's, that's where I could ho- you know, hopefully transmit to the audience that this was not ordinary. This was not normal. Um, I, I tried to describe the reaction of opposing players, the reactions of opposing coaches, what was happening on those benches when Jimmer was doing this, because there was a lot, There were a lot of upturned hands and shrugged shoulders and dropped heads and, and, and just people shaking their heads that was going on all season long. And I was doing it the same way verbally. I was, I was shaking my head. It would happen time and again where you don't expect him to take that shot, but yep, he's going to take it and he's going to make it. You you would, you would, you would simply say that's too deep and it would get deeper and deeper. He'd take them and he'd make them. And it was just over and over again. And it was really, it was really the most, the most fun season, because of of how um, embraceable his story was. This was actually at a time, Joel, when when, when BYU was in a conference that didn't have the best TV deal. Um, it was on the Mountain Network, and it was a little less widely available. And ESPN kind of picked him up on a parenthetical basis because BYU's games weren't appearing on ESPN, generally speaking. Huh. Um, but 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 ESPN, we all kind of take that ways. for granted now. <laughs> yeah, BSBN found ways to get their Jimmer content that year, and Jimmer Mania became a thing because he was so much like so many people, right? He was kind of like average size, um, upstate New York, um, just kind of a guy, right? But he had this remarkable ability to score from anywhere, and and he was doing it against everyone. Um, this wasn't a, you know, a, a situation of a of a small school or a small league, you're not playing anybody. He was playing people and beating good people and, and, and doing it regularly and being defended by guys like Kawhi Leonard. Uh, and, and this was a guy who could literally do it against everyone. And that, that was the, 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 the neatest thing was that you felt that as long as Jimmer has got the ball in his hands, he's playing for your team. You've got a shot to beat this team, whoever you're playing. And, and BYU did get to the sweet 16 in his senior season and maybe, but for a missed free throw, in overtime, uh, might have defeated Florida and gone on to who knows what beyond the Elite Eight. Didn't turn out that way as BYU lost a pretty important player in Brandon Davies for the NCAA tournament. Jimmer turned it up a notch, but even then, it wasn't quite enough. It was sad to see that that journey come to an end, but it was an amazing journey. And it was, uh, I, again, there, there were days and nights where I just, you know, kind of lost my mind at what he was doing. It was so much fun to call his games that year. And again, there were certain baskets and certain plays where you just, sense that, uh-oh, I've just, I, I just gone to an octave I didn't think I could get to because of how crazy it is what I just saw. But um, it was just an honor to, to cover that guy uh, for his whole career, really. But that last year was when that train got rolling, and it was so fun to be with the BYU basketball program that year. It became a true uh, rock star type situation everywhere BYU went, and I'll never forget it. it always, I always kind of felt that, like, the – the more extraordinary a player or a talent or a team is, sometimes the harder it makes the job because you've got to be able to create that separation and and truly paint that picture of how unique something is. Uh, so I'm always kind of curious when you get somebody that's that's that transcendent. Um, 
how that plays uh, in, into into somebody's into somebody's job and somebody's description. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I know you listen back to your stuff. Uh, how often do you get mm-hmm. to do that? Uh, weekly. I mean, game by game. Uh, I just have to. Okay. I, I need to. I need to hear what the listeners heard. Um, you know, I when I'm in the moment, I'm in the moment, and and I'll go back, and invariably I'll pick up on things I missed while I was calling it, missed while I was saying it. Sometimes it's things that, um, uh, from a positive standpoint. Sometimes it's things that are negative. Like, I won't. I'll I'll, I'll make a small mistake, but I won't have noticed it live, and I'll only notice it on. Uh, on the re-listen, you know, and and so I, I always pick up on stuff, and I'm making mental notes. Sometimes I'm making physical notes, but ultimately I'm listening as not Greg Rubel. I'm listening as um, just Greg the listener. Uh, how is this guy doing? Uh, what is he saying? How is he saying it? How up to date is he on the time and score? Am I following? Um, and so I just try to listen as objectively as possible. Separate myself from my voice. And, and see what I can come up with, but but the, the the review and the critiques have to be constant for me. I just need to continue to um, find ways to get better, and I only do that by 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 reliving uh, the broadcast. What types of things bother you, or 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 are you happy with when you listen back as a as a listener as a fan? I, I'm happiest when I feel like. Um, like I got into a good rhythm and use that word earlier, but when I feel like it was a rhythmic segment of, of commentary between myself and my partner, it was accurate. It was a crisp, it was entertaining. It was compelling Then I feel like it, it became a well-rounded segment. Uh, and, 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 and it could be a short segment, a longer segment. I like when I feel like it, it all clicked, um, and, and I, I don't like when I do make those little mistakes. Like I said, if, if, I, if I can catch a mistake that I've made, uh, that's, that's always a little bit of an, an annoyance to me. Um, and, and the mistakes can vary, uh, but sometimes it's just, it, you know, you can get yourself caught up and, and you might transpose a number in your mind. Um, you might say it was one team doing something when it was the other just because your brain got caught up at, yeah. at a certain moment. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's going it's going to happen, and no one's again. I, the perfect game is elusive, and I think listeners forgive um, you know certain mistakes, but you know it's always a really stark reminder that you only get one chance to make the right call, right? You you only get one chance to describe it properly. Um, there's a little more leeway in TV, um, in, in in a TV broadcast. You know what you say may or may not be integral to the play because as long as the visual is being transmitted, the viewer sees what happened. The viewer knows what went down. Um, but if you're not right on the radio, um, you know the, the the listener won't have gotten the correct idea of what just went down. Um, I'll end on this note. Uh, it is the week. It's the first week of August. Um, so football season is a month away. Uh, what are you doing right now? What's your what, what's your uh, what's your month look like to get prepared? Well, uh, we just uh, wrapped up our last family vacation yesterday, uh, being the last weekend of July. So now we're in the first week of August. So um, I take my vacation time in a very narrow window uh, because once you hit the first week of August, you're going <laughs> uh, you know straight through to the spring without any vacation time, and so every week becomes a six or seven day work week uh, without fail because every Saturday essentially is a game day and. And uh, and weekends for broadcasters, as you know, aren't, aren't typical weekends for everyone else. You know, because you're you're working every weekend essentially, and that's the job. And it's not a complaint a complaint by any stretch. It's just the life we have, and it's a really fun life. But you do um, you do embrace that vacation time when you get it in the off season. When you do get a bit of an off season. But now that we're into the first week of August, uh, that means camps begin uh, football and women's soccer in this case. And so it's attending practices. It's overseeing interns who will be helping you in covering those practices. It's starting to uh, study personnel. It's starting to uh, nail down your memorizations. Um, and that's something we really didn't talk a lot about, Joel, but also, too, is, is how much memorization plays into, um, you know, what we do, you know, for a living as play-by-play guys. And that's, and that's a big, big part of, of my job, and it starts in fall camp. Um, you know, I, I leave the first, second week of August with that 105-player roster uh, pretty well committed to memory at that point. And so on a weekly basis, all I'm doing is kicking out the old opponent and, and bringing in the new opponent and those 60 or 70 or 80 numbers I want to lock in 
in the course of a given week are all new week to week, but BYU's numbers remain locked in since August, and that's what I get into right now is is noting personnel, noting patterns, noting depth charts, and starting to memorize numbers. And so uh, now is that time, and here within a couple of weeks we'll have our first soccer broadcast. Uh, first football broadcast is the 29th. Some coaches shows earlier that week, and uh, we are off and running. If people want to find uh, you or BYU, uh, how do they track you down on social media and the like? Well, uh, uh, for BYU, uh, at BYU Cougars is the all-serving uh, Twitter account for all of athletics. Uh, for me personally, just my name, at Greg Rubel, and it's uh, G-R-E-G, Greg, uh, and then the last name right with it is it's a little unusual spelling, W-R-U-B as in uh, basketball, E-L-L. So at Greg Rubel on Twitter uh, for all of your BYU sports stuff. All right, that's Greg Rubel joining us here on PXPCast. I will cut the closing short because I have to go edit some video, and then I have to go to bed because I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, and I'm in Costa Rica. Um, Not because I was doing anything wild. Like, I I was up till three editing video. I'm just tired. Uh, But we'll talk to you next week. It's another episode of Play-By-Playcast. My name is Joel Godet, and we are out. That will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.